it is 2.15, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the CTRC 10th Annual Telehealth Summit. Um, we are so glad you can join us for today's session on telehealth diabetic retinopathy screening. We're going to review some best practices, clinical value, and a modern contracting model in today's session. I'm Aislinn Taylor, and I'm the CTRC Program Specialist, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Just a reminder that this session is for informational purposes. We have no relevant financial interest, arrangement, or affiliation with any organizations or commercial products or services discussed during this presentation at the summit. Before we begin, just a few tips for the Whova platform. Um, it's super easy to use and navigate the platform using the web portal and their mobile app. You can check out upcoming sessions, um, communicate and chat with other attendees, and also check out our sponsors and their offers. Uh, make sure your profile is up to date so that uh, you can use this platform to network with the other attendees. One more note that today's session is being recorded and will be available to view through the event platform in the next week. Lastly, please feel free to post your questions using the Zoom chat or the Whova chat window. We'll hold the last few minutes for Q&A. And with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers for this session, Dr. Mark Shuchinsky and Harry Green from the UC, Davis Dig UC Berkeley Digital Health. Um, Dr. Shuchinsky is a clinical outreach specialist with the UC Berkeley Digital Health. He's been there for over a decade, assisting partner clinics with on-staff training and in-staff services, technical support, and other telehealth services. And Dr. Green took over the directorship of the UC Berkeley Digital Health in 2010 and has grown the pro program significantly over that time, thanks to the outstanding work of the UC Berkeley team. Doctors, I'm going to hand it over to you to go ahead with your presentation. Thanks so much, Aislinn, and, and thank you so much to the CTRC for having us um, present here today. Um, we're going to be getting a little bit into sort of more nitty gritty details um, than I think uh, some of the other presenters that have presented today so far. Um, and what what uh, what we really want you to take away from this, uh, obviously, if you're interested in diabetic retinopathy screening and you're an FQAC in California, um, we'd be happy to work with you. But what we the, the overall um, goal today is really to give you an idea of the 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 specifics that go into really running this type of program, um, which is a specialty type of program. But uh, screening the retina of diabetics has actually been a primary care uh, task traditionally uh, for a very long time. It's just the primary care providers just don't have the time now to develop the skills and dilate their patients to be doing the screening themselves. And so what our program actually does is increase the uh, access to care for a lot of um, uh, underprivileged patients uh, who don't have real access to eye care or don't get the eye care and put that, put that in the primary care clinic, which they're much more likely to, to present to and uh, make it more convenient to them and obviously get better compliance. Um, and uh, based on some of the questions from previous uh, uh, presentations today, uh, we will get into some nitty gritty about billing. Um, and so hopefully that will uh, sort of give you an idea, at least the, the challenges that we faced developing a, a billing model, but that there are um, certainly ways for FQHCs to be able to have at least our service paid for but I'm sure that that expands to other types of, of uh, telehealth services as well. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark and uh, Mark, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, th this is our website and our general email that goes to the whole team uh, in case you have any questions or want to find out more. And today we'll be uh, splitting up the presentation in uh, in two, essentially. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, the details of uh, starting a program and implementing a program and maintaining one. And then Dr. Green will talk a little bit about the billing. Uh, so who are we? Uh, we're a nonprofit program out of the School of Optometry at UC Berkeley. Um, the three uh, members of my team up in the 
in the North Bay in um, Berkeley are Dr. Green, the director, uh, the assistant director, Connie McCullough, and our coordinator, Graciela Resendez. Uh, we have been around for about 17 years. Um, we expanded uh, in 2007 with a, a large grant from the California Healthcare Foundation. And um, I'm in the Southland kind of by design to help out our Southern California clinics. And um, as you can see on the map there, we serve um, clinics all over California as far north as Wairica, as far south as Calexico. Uh, we work in about 100, with 100 individual health systems, including public health departments and hospitals and Indian Health Service um, clinics. And uh, right now we currently have about 230 something uh, individual sites throughout California. And most of us, most of the sites are clustered in, in three kind of distinct areas. Uh, the Southland, L LA County, Ventura, Inland Empire, Orange County, um, and the North Bay, and then up and down the Route 99 Central Valley Corridor. And um, we partner with IPAC. So we're actually two separate entities, although we're often confused for the same thing, but IPAC is our uh, telehealth platform partner. And they are, uh, they are the developer of the website that we use for the store and forward technology. Uh, they also are a camera vendor and they do much more, but th those are two of their main functions. Uh, Dr. Quadros uh, in the back of that photo is, is the, the founder and CEO. And uh, one important thing about IPAX is that it's a, um, it's a level three approved screening program. So this is one of those uh, buyer beware uh, notes here. If you're shopping around for a teleretinal program, uh, you obviously want to find one that's good quality. And so most of the screening programs out there are not level three. Levels one and two tend to have um, a low specificity, low sensitivity, lower sensitivity. And so you'll get over referrals and you'll also get misdiagnoses, which you obviously in, in a perfect world do not want. And um, one other great thing about IPAX, it, uh, you can develop an interface or they already have interfaces with the major EMR systems. And if they don't, they can develop one uh, usually, usually within uh, a few months time. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology and kind of physiology of diabetes, but I promise I won't get too deep. Um, Diabetes is the number one cause of vision loss in, uh, in Americans, in working age Americans. And uh, what we know is that that prevalence is growing. Right now, uh, in, in 2005, there were 5.5 million 40 plus Americans with a diabetic retinopathy diagnosis, just not with diabetes, but with a diabetic retinopathy diagnosis. That's expected to triple by 2050. So. Uh, while we actually, most of the leading causes of vision loss um, have decreased over the last 20 or 30 years, diabetes, diabetic retinopathy is the only one where the prevalence has increased. Um, and it's actually increased significantly. Uh, vision impairment has increased by about 28% over the last 30 years. Um, and then the, the most of our patients are in safety net clinics. Uh, on average, if you have 12 patients in a room that have diabetes, one of those patients will have what's called vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit soon. All right, I, I'm going to get a little microscopic here, but I promise it won't be too bad. Uh, the, the question of why is it that a person with diabetes uh, could lose their vision? Uh, that has to do on the on the anatomical level with the small vessels in the back of the eye, the small arteries and veins. And there's a cell inside those veins and arteries called parasites, and they basically give the vessel stability. So um, I think about diabetic retinopathy as um, a leaky and occluded garden hose, right? So if, it's, if it has holes in it, the hose will leak just like these vessels can leak in the back of the eye. And if the hose is occluded, 
uh, <laughs> there will be low circulation of water. Just as with vessels, there's low circulation of, of the, the blood. And so you get this chronic ischemia. And vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy results in a couple of things. And four, four of those entities are listed here, macular edema, hemorrhaging, retinal detachment, and neovascular glaucoma. So those are the things that we're screening for in the, in the photographs, in the images that we receive from our, um, our clinics. And this is, this is kind of the, the big picture with uh, preventing vision loss from diabetic retinopathy. Uh, several things have to align in order for us to be able to, to prevent someone from going blind or, or losing their vision. And one of them is timely screening. Uh, the second is prompt referral and treatment compliance is the third. So if all those things work, work well, we have a 90 to 95% effect effectiveness in preventing someone from losing vision for the rest of their life, right? And so the key of course is, is timeliness. And that's, that's kind of our reason for being is we want to be there at the point of care where we capture the patients and screen them to see who needs that timely and prompt referral. Um, and so what, what do the guidelines say? Uh, the ADA um, in, in general recommends an annual screening, screening. There are some nuances and there are some specifics to that, uh, but in general, an annual screening is, is what is recommended. And the ADA, in addition, also recommends retinal photography um, as, as a, um, either in substitution or as a complement to the retinal screening. And so as we all know, most of our patients don't actually make it to an eye doctor for, for various reasons. There are all sorts of barriers that prevent them from getting that annual screening. And so that, that is where we come in as a teleretinal prov provider is to help capture those patients. Uh, one, one important thing I should say is that we, we never want the message to get across that the retinal screening is a substitute for a comprehensive eye exam, but um, we don't want to let the, uh, the perfect be the enemy of the good in, in this public health problem. Um, how are we doing as a, as a group, as, an, as a nation with diabetic retinopathy screening? Uh, the answer is we're getting about half of it right. Uh, about 50% of our patients uh, currently are being screened. Uh, after COVID, those, those levels dropped quite significantly. So if you, if you look at the 2007 level for the Medicaid HMO category, and I'm just considering that because th that's the brunt of our, our population, uh, we were actually able to push the levels up from about 50% to 57%. Uh, and then COVID hit us and the levels dropped back down. And so our, our gains were erased uh, over the last 13 years. Um, so that's, uh, uh, for, me, for many of our FQHCs, that has been a problem is pushing the needle on compliance. But what we know is that most patients with diabetes, uh, some estimates rated at about 88% to 90%, do actually see their primary care provider. And that's where we kind of meet the patient halfway is in the clinic. Um, there have been some studies about, well, what happens if the patient with diabetic retinopathy has a delay in care? And one study showed that the average delay in care was about uh, two months, 60 days. And another study showed that for those requiring uh, intravitreal injections, which is one of, one of the mainstay treatments for diabetic retinopathy, a delay in care of about of a little over five weeks actually resulted in vision loss. So um, we we really kind of uh, suffered, and the and the patients suffered over the course of the last three years in that some of them just didn't make it to the clinic and lost their vision permanently because of that. So um, there's good evidence to show that in-house point of care diabetic retinopathy screening programs can increase the not only compliance, but treatment um, and provider referral rates. And one of the big studies over the course of the, the public health emergency over the course of the pandemic uh, showed that uh, 
the, the, a, a screening program in Kentucky, which included about 14,000 encounters, doubled compliance and, and of course doubled um, vision threatening detection. Um, not only that, but patients preferred having their retina screened at, at, at their doctor's office rather than making an appointment, going to the appointment and having the appointment at a, at a live eye care provider. Uh, another question becomes, do, is, are, is imaging actually uh, as good as a live eye care exam? And the answer is yes. And so this, this study just shows that uh, compared to a live eye care provider, ophthalmologist and optometrist, looking at images, uh, high quality images is uh, much better, has a much higher sensitivity and specificity than looking at a live eye, eye that's moving around with a with a small lens and a patient that really doesn't want that uh, that light in their eye. So uh, we we do have a uh, a few surveys of clinics uh, as to what their HEDIS rates were before our program and after our program. I'm just including two of them, and these are two of the successful ones. But we've been able to move. The, the compliance needle about 35 uh, to 45 percentage points um, by implementation of the program. One of the keys to remember is um, if there is administrative will and there are incentives to maintain the program at the, at the clinic, uh, you, you generally will see a pretty robust raise in the compliance rate. Uh, if there's if it's kind of on the back burner and not a priority, we don't tend to get a you know a lot of a lot of patients getting screened. So uh, just a couple of uh, cases just to show you what telehealth at its best looks like when it's running on all pistons. Um, this is a case of a 37 year old female, so a very very young patient with type two diabetes, who uh, was seen at a FQHC in the Bay Area. Uh, she was screened uh, by her, she was, uh, she saw her PCP and she was screened that same day with the retinal camera. Uh, the images were reviewed by an optometrist consultant uh, with UC Berkeley one day later, and she was referred for one of the, one of the entities that causes vision loss, uh, macular edema. And four days later, she was seen by a retinal specialist and treated. And so uh, her vision you know, remained 2020 uh, after that. Uh, had, had she not been treated, uh, there, there's a very high chance that she would have had permanent vision loss. And then just a, a, a slightly different element uh, of how telehealth can help with patient compliance. This is a patient uh, who had an a A1C that was relative moderately high, 9.7. And that's just a magnification of the macula, which is kind of the, the sacred ground of the eye, the central vision area. And then this is the macula, I believe it's a few years later. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, one year later, the, uh, the A1C had gone down to 5.5. So in a live eye care setting with my patients, I. I will often review the photographs that I take of their eyes just to show them where they are today, a year, a year before, and then in the future, and just to show them the progress. So if, so there are uh, some, some cases where the A1C goes down, the, the blood sugar is well controlled, and we can, we can actually vis visibly see that in the back of the eye and share that with the patient. And that's often very encouraging. Uh, we can use, uh, retinal images as education tools, and we can teach uh, the clinic staff how to, you know, be able to compare normal retinas to the patient's retina and to help help them kind of ed educate some of the staff as to what the patient could might be seeing when they look at their own retina. So um, some basics on how this all works. Um, the first step, well, uh, there are many. There are many first steps. One general first step is camera acquisition, and we can work with virtually any camera. Some clinics purchase their own cameras, uh, new or refurbished. Uh, others um, rent from us, 
And um, one very important thing that I want to I want to also a buyer beware is that we do not currently recommend any handheld cameras. In fact, none of the major eye care or telemedicine uh, organizations, including the British National Health Service, which, which is probably the largest health uh, image, imaging, teleretinal imaging program in the world, uh, do not recommend handheld cameras for, for various reasons. One is uh, poor quality, stability issues, they're hard, hard to learn. So uh, we, we, we do work with some handheld cameras, but we, uh, the devil is in the details. So once a clinic gets a handheld camera, they soon find out that it's not as easy as, as just you know, having an inexpensive camera with a small footprint. Uh, we do provide uh, staff certification, so we don't kind of give you hand you the camera and then say take some pictures. We want to make sure you're taking good pictures, so we don't have a high rejection rate, and that there's good quality of the images, and that's that's very important to us. Uh, so we often will um, do provide the first sort of uh, training on site, and uh, usually we can also do remote training. And we have a train the trainers kind of model where any certified staff member can train anyone else fairly easily. Um, once you're ready to go live with real clinical images, uh, the patient images are captured and, I, and uploaded to the IPAX portal. Uh, usually within 24 to 48 hours, those images will be graded and consulted and you'll get an assessment and recommendation that's uh, generated as, as a PDF and sent to the PCP. If you have a um, EMR with an interface to IPAX, then it automatically goes, goes the report goes to the patient's account in, within the EMR. And this is just a, a sample of what the report looks like, the PDF report. And it, it includes various elements that Dr. Green will, will talk about a little bit later. And this is just a general workflow of how uh, asynchronous store and forward diabetic retinopathy screenings works. Um, the images are transmitted, stored in ipex.org, consulted by the distant provider, the report is generated and a referral or recommendation is made. Uh, Thank you very, very much for your time. I'm going to seed control over to Dr. Green. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Trzysinski. Um, so uh, I'm actually going to uh, switch over to sharing my screen. Um, and just so that we can, there were a couple of slides that I, think we missed. And so I'm going to run it off of my computer. So just give me just a sec here. Okay. Um, can everybody see that? Okay. And hear me okay? Okay. Um, so thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shostinsky. Um, One of the things that that is um, critical to the decision about choosing uh, is, is actually choosing a partner um, to do this type of, of care. Um, and most, most of the primary care clinic organizations out there don't have a lot of experience in this. And it really is, uh, there really are some, some big pitfalls that I just wanted to bring up if this is something that you're interested in implementing. Um, uh, so a lot of the diabetic retinopathy screening programs that are out there, um, they, use, they use whatever imaging modality that they think is good enough. Um, and it really is just to try and get the the uh, the quality of care measure HEDIS checkbox um, checked, and so there are a number of the, there are a number of programs out there that are really not using evidence based medicine to really drive their their uh, their programs. 
And I would imagine that this is something that probably is not just unique to our particular little uh, healthcare niche in terms of eye care uh, and diabetic retinopathy. But, uh, you know, the, one of the things that I think part of the larger discussion that, that goes back to some of the discussion and, and presentations from earlier uh, in the day really is about, um, about quality of care and making sure that that quality is there. Uh, one of the things that I think is going to be a challenge is to, uh, in whatever telehealth you're talking about, making sure that the quality actually is there and doing your due diligence to make sure that whatever uh, whatever approach that you take to any particular uh, healthcare problem and using te telehealth, that you're not somehow... Um, uh, cheating, uh, cheating the patient in some ways, I guess that's probably not the best word, but you're, you're not providing the, the best care that you possibly can. Um, and you're not providing sufficient care. Um, so for instance, there are a number of programs. In fact, one of the, the major ones is, is, uh, from, uh, from Hillrom where they're using single images that are just not sufficient for screening with enough sensitivity and specificity. And there's a whole bunch of literature on that. They're not covering enough of the retinal area with their photos because most photos don't cover the, well, no photos cover the entire retinal area. Um, and most photos are a very constricted part of it. Um, they're not taking pictures of the right retinal locations. And having multiple pictures helps you make sure that, that if there are artifacts in the images, which often most of these imaging systems will have some type of artifact, that you actually are able to see those artifacts disappear in, uh, in pictures from different vantage points. Um, the, the other part of it, which is something that we're, we're very much um, dedicated to, specifically at UC Berkeley, is, is that is ongoing services. Being able to set up and maintain a diabetic retinopathy screening in a primary care clinic really requires a partnership and ongoing uh, um, interaction between your, you and your partner. And really what you're looking for is you're looking for an imaging modality that's going to provide good enough care for your patients and really meet a, a, a standard. Um, in, in our case, we use overlapping, we use smaller field images, but we use overlapping ones so we cover a larger area. Uh, there are also ultra wide fields cameras. The one, uh, the picture in the bottom right here, that's a huge area of the retina covered by a single image. Um, but you know those that those types of imaging systems are are much more expensive. So there's a, a cost uh, benefit sort of um, analysis you have to do there. And then those supportive ser support services are really important. Initial setup actually takes a, a lot. Uh, it's, there's, there's quite a bit of momentum um, that needs to be overcome to, to actually, or inertia, I should say, to overcome to actually start up one of these programs and get everything lined up in, in a row. And that includes training and working on how that's going to flow through your clinic. Um, and then maintenance, which is quality control with your photographers, making sure the images are, are, that are coming through are, are good, um, that there's technical support if there's breakdown in equipment or help uh, needed with setting up accounts um, or uh, on, the, on, on the platform um, or any other kind of technical support that, that is required with the technology because all of this requires technology, right? Um, and then the fact that there's a lot of staff turnover. Uh, we work mostly in the FQ, HC, and RHC space, and we know that there's a lot of staff turnover, which means that you need new MAs trained and that sort of thing to be able to, to, to image. So, so just be aware that there, there's a lot that goes into this, um, and it's, it's, I think, easy, easy to be sort of wowed by um, the flashy pictures, but if if the if the program isn't set up, you're not going to be getting the same level of quality for your patient, uh, the same same quality of care for your patients. So um, switching gears, I'm going to I'm going to go into the the billing component of this, and just bear with me. There's a lot of sort of details here 
Um, we're happy to, uh, Dr. Shurstinsky and I will be in um, the peer chats, which is the next session. Um, so if you have some, if you have a bunch of questions, that sort of thing, if we don't get to them during this, this part, we can certainly uh, discuss that with you in the peer sessions. Um, and this does get murky and, and the details really are, um, they, 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 they bog the, they bog the entire process down. Um, I've been working in this space for almost 15 years. And during that time, while we have been successful in helping a lot of patients, the, the, uh, the billing models have, have not been very good for this. And we've done a lot of research. Our, our team has done a lot of research looking into um, PPS billing specifically in FQHCs and, and RHCs. Um, uh, and it, you know, it is something that we've, we've found lots of evidence that it's, it, it is allowed. And uh, the old adage of it has to be a certain way, those, those are, we've started to shed a lot of the things like I'll discuss face-to-face -face visits and that kind of stuff. Um, those, old, that, those, those old things that were in the way before have really started to move in a direction where they aren't necessarily. And of course, it's always going to be a balance between, well, you know, it has to, there has to be a certain level of medical value, but you know, we're optometrists are billable providers. And so, you know, there's medical value in, in, in this particular uh, screening procedure. And therefore, you know, it does, we feel like there, there's no question that it does qualify for P PPS reimbursement, which finally gives the FQHCs and RHCs really a financial model by which they can support these type of services rather than having to depend on grants or other, or taking money away from, from other operating costs to be able to, to provide this for their patients. Um, the vast majority of the patients that are in, and this only really applies, you know, th this is only really applicable, what we're gonna talk, what I'm gonna talk about here, it's only really applicable in, in California. The um, California, you know, th there are certain laws that I'm gonna, the legislation that I'm going to talk about that don't necessarily uh, translate to other states. And so it's important to understand that. And if you're in another state and you're interested in this kind of thing, then there is some homework that you need to do. Although we're, we're happy to, if you want to contact us, uh, at least tell you how we went about looking for the little nuggets that really um, nail down those different pieces that you need to make sure that this is really a, a billable um, procedure. So um, most of the patients in the FQHCs and RHCs are gonna be uh, Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And this, this data comes from the CPCA. And so there's uh, a lot of potential there because what I'm gonna talk about specifically actually only applies to Medi-Cal, Medi-Cal managed care, and then if your private insurance is willing to pay for the service, then obviously, um, you know, private insurances can do whatever they, they want. Um, it does not include Medicare because Medicare, the federal level legislation has not necessarily addressed every single uh, component um, that, 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 that needs to be put together to make sure that this is a billable event. So just be aware of that. It, it does not include Medicare as of, as of now. I, I actually think that it's just a matter of time but before it does, but um, we have to, you know, there's, there's baby steps, right? Um, and really the purpose of the PPS billing, again, is, is to develop, developing that sustainable financial model to be able to support a service like this in your clinic but also to help automatically register your, your quality of care measures and get your HEDIS points for capturing that, uh, that uh, measure without having to do any kind of administrative follow-up, like faxing a bunch of uh, retinal reports over to the insurance company to show it. That takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources. So in the Medi-Cal manual, um, for rural, in the, in the part two for rural health uh, clinics and federally qualified health centers, um, asynchronous store and forward reimbursement is absolutely permitted for an established patient. 
So, but these are all going to be established patient because they're not going to just walk off the street and, and come to your clinic just for the diabetic retinopathy screening. They're going to be established patients within your clinic. Um, and it, it's for teleophthalmology, teledermatology, and teledentistry. Um, and it's okay for that billable provider to be at a distance site. And that's what we, that's what we are. Uh, our consulting that we do is remote, um, but it, you know, the fact that we're remote doesn't disqualify it. Um, this actually, this little blurb, and I, I, I hate to bring up uh, the legalese and that sort of thing, but this is actually a really important thing. And it's actually been, uh, uh, it's actually been in the law for a very long time. Um, and this really addresses the face-to-face -face issue. That's the thing that we hear most. It's like, it's not face-to-face, -face, it's not face-to-face. -face. Actually, for teleophthalmology and teledermatology, it doesn't need to be. AB 415 in section 10, the, this, this is actually, well, this was enacted in 2011, so this was an amendment. But face-to-face -face contact between the healthcare provider and a patient shall not be required under the Medi-Cal program for teleophthalmology, teledermatology by store and forward. Um, and it is so it's not it's not something that absolutely it, it's not a requirement specifically for this. Now in 2019, and I forget what A B it is, I want to say it's A B 754 or something like that. That was in 2019. Um, uh, as far as my reading of it, it actually expanded this to other things too. Um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna comment on that because this this really established it, at least for what we do, which is the teleophthalmology part. Um, and the CTRC has um, a great, uh, it has, I think it's an entire page actually on this. This is just a blurb on this, but um, this, you know, there, there are uh, quite a bit of subtleties. And uh, so the CTRC, their telehealth reimbursement guide ha also has guidance on this. And you can download that from the, the link up at the top. And I'm sure you can find it on the CTRC website. This is a this is indirect, but it is it gives us an idea of what's going to happen in the future, which is that the DC, DHCS. This is actually a telehealth advisory work group. So this is within the DHCS, and that this work group is basically going to basically making recommendations for the next telehealth re legislation, which I believe is supposed to happen in uh, 2023. Um, and interesting, I'm not really sure why they did this backwards, because to me, it's more, uh, you know, it's more logical to say what the current state is. But the current state is at the bottom here. And FQHCs are reimbursed at the prospective payment system rate for video, audio only, and store and forward, and are not subject to site limitations for either the patient or the provider. Um, so this is, they're, you know, saying this outright, that this is the current state. And the proposed the, the, the proposed approach is basically to continue that, which means that you know in the future this is not likely to change. This is not likely to be a COVID only type of, uh, of approach. That this is what they're going to recommend that the governor enact in the next telehealth bill. So. What it takes in general, and again, these are just sort of nitty gritty uh, specifics, but we we have uh, taken the we have taken the stance that our optometrist should be credentialed with the FQHC, and the FQHC then can bill with the the provider's NPI, and so even though it's through a contractual agreement between UC Berkeley and the FQHC we still credential our optometrists with the FQHC for compliance reasons. Um, and then, you know, that's with the FQHC and then their payers. Um, and then for billing submission, we provide uh, guidance uh, in as to what needs to actually, what codes need to be used and how they need to be used. We provide all of that. Again, that's one of the services that we provide in trying to, to make this a much more uh, financially sustainable uh, program for the FQHCs. Okay, um, and that pretty much does it for me. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but again, we'll be in the, the peer chats as well.
Hi, a great presentation. Thank you so much, Harry and Mark, uh, for joining us and uh, presenting at our summit. Um, I have to say, for me, I, the nitty gritty is one of my favorite things. I know for a lot of people that may not be interesting, but for us, it definitely is. So thank you for going into detail into your model and providing that information. I think that's really informative. Um, one more reminder for everybody uh, to drop your questions into the chat. We have a little bit of time. Um, so please feel free to uh, chat into Zoom or through the Whova platform. Um, get your questions answered now. Um, and also a note, I uh, thank you guys again for giving a, a nice plug for our reimbursement guide for CTRC. Just want to throw that out there that uh, Jeannie Russell, our training and technical assistance manager, has just done a fabulous update on that guide. Um, so it is updated for July 2022. So new information is available. Um, and I have put the link to that in the Whova, Whova chat um, for everybody to access if you'd like. Um, so we'll see if we get a few questions um, coming in to the chat, maybe in a few minutes. I, I do see one one thing to please place the contact information in the chat. I imagine, Aislinn, that, that our contact information is also available. Um, uh, yes, um, I have responded and shared the direct UC Berkeley okay. digital health email. Um, but if you want to visit uh, Harry or Mark's speaker profile, um, you are able to uh, access their direct emails and the recording from today's presentation will be available uh, to do that. So it looks like we got our first question. Um, so uh, asking, are you having pushback from sites using this billing model? How has the adoption been? Um, well, we're, we're still working on that. And, and it, it, I wouldn't call it pushback. I mean, some of it has been a little pushy backy, but you know, this, the sites are really open to it. I think because they really want to, um, they really want to believe that it is something that even though many of them that were, that were switching this model over to, we've been working for, for 10, 12, 15 years, many of them, you know, that it, it, again, it's just sort of like from the established point of view of you need these certain criteria. Um, and to be honest, you know, I, I would say DHCS has not been particularly um, clear with any of these things. A lot of the things that I just presented are, are, are things that we had to dig out of all kinds of different resources. Um, and, it, it, you know, it would be really great if there was an official, this is how you can do this type of, um, uh, uh, of resource specifically from the, the Department of Healthcare Services. Because I know the CR CTRC and the CPCA, they've, they've done some things to try and clarify these things, but it's still really, you know, uh, some of it is actually fear. Some of it is, is that uh, the fear of being audited really stops the, the clinics from really wanting to, to do this. So from, from that point of view, yeah, the, you know, we've had a lot of very lively discussions and we've learned a lot along the way because we're not an FQHC. And so the billing for an FQHC is, is, is uh, I mean, I, I, I don't even know how you guys get to actually doing healthcare because the billing seems to be so uh, confusing and crazy. But, you know, the, the, the bottom line is, is that I think that there's, we have, we've gathered a lot of evidence that there's complete justification for this. Um, and, you know, could we use some very direct guidance from the DHCS? Absolutely. And if anybody in the audience has any direct <laughs> contact with the DHCS, it isn't something that, that that's not an easy wall to crack, but it really is something that, um, I am completely confident is is allowable. There just isn't there just isn't the the thing laid out specifically by them, um, and so it 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 makes it difficult. We're we're coming up on time here. Yeah, Aislinn. Oh, you're 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 muted. 
Hello. Uh, this session, sorry, does go until 3.15, so we have time for a few more questions. Um, so uh, it does. there is some comments uh, kind of agreeing that there is some hesitancy building, billing for these types of things. But just to clarify, you do have FQHCs that are billing um, in this model currently? Um, yeah, so we've over the last 12 to 18 months, we've started to transition um, all of our clinics as, as our contracts have been coming to renew and that sort of thing. Um, and so we've 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 started to transition many of them, uh, I would say maybe half of them so far um, over to this model. Uh, and a lot of them are still sort of trying to figure it out. And we're still working through credentialing issues and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, switching over is not an overnight thing. Um, but many of our clinics are, are on board and we're just working through a lot of those kind of logistical issues. And um, mentioned in the presentation, but one more time, do sites have to credential the provider first to bill this way? Um, unfortunately, I think most of the question the answer to these questions is it's unclear. The reason why we have uh we've decided that we should credential with the clinics is to be more safe than sorry yeah. to be honest the primary care provider i i do believe the primary care provider actually um with the codes that we recommend billing this could actually be coded under the primary care provider um but and maybe that's how it will turn out to be you know when it sort of flushes out um, because there's uh, there's a there's a CPT two code in there that can be used specifically for for the heatest measures um, to be credited without using the NPI of an optometrist. But so it 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 gets kind of complicated. I I don't I don't know that it's absolutely necessary, but I think it's the conservative approach at this point. I agree. Better to be safe than sorry. With some of those things, it it's a. Uh... A common thing we experience um, with our technical assistance is just erring on the side of caution when it comes to credentialing and a lot of stuff just to make sure you're safe. Um, it's always good practice. Uh, there is a question asking about IPACs. Um, just to uh, wondering if there is a specific type of healthcare worker that can use these tools or is there a license or certification? needed to use the IPACs or similar tools? Um, IPACs is, uh, th there isn't any specific type of healthcare worker um, specifically. So um, uh, the, the we were, our program uses optometrists specifically as consultants, but you can actually become IPAC certified consultant uh, anybody can. Um, there are some disadvantages to having somebody who's not a not an eye care provider uh, do it in my personal opinion. But specifically for diabetic retinopathy, you don't have to be you don't have uh, you don't have to be uh, any sort of specific healthcare worker. Um, you know, you, you really probably should be a, a high level provider. But I know that. PAs or NPs or anything like that could, can learn how to grade diabetic retinopathy. And in fact, if you look at the National Health Service in Britain, which of course they have different rules, but um, they actually use certified uh, uh, folks who aren't eye care providers or any specific healthcare workers. They're just really, really well trained to find the lesions that they're looking for. Um, my personal opinion is, is that there's an advantage to having an, a specifically a, a, an eye care specialist do do the readings because there's an awful lot of other stuff that we find that are that is wrong with the eye that we find coincidentally. And um, I'm sure that screening also, you know, we're looking at ways to expand screening to other populations and that sort of thing. And so having that knowledge, I think, is a benefit for our program specifically. But um, any, anybody can actually become IPAC certified, um, through IPACs. You don't need any kind of special, um, uh, license or type, but whether or not you can actually use that to practice, that's, that's a bit of an, that, that's a different question. 
Well, thank you. Uh, are you aware if there are any grants or funding opportunities for the technology portion of that? Um, there, there have been in the past. Uh, so, so the USDA had uh, programs for a while, um, and I'm not sure if they have current ones. But um, if you're part of the Indian Health Service uh, Services, you can all you can oftentimes find find funding um, from the Indian Health Service. Um, and what we're actually seeing uh, recently is is that primary. Uh, so primary insurers like Anthem, like well, Anthem's one of the sponsors of this, uh, you know, they, they're they actually looking at purchasing the equipment for these clinics because the compliance is so low. They're real, They're just like, we'll give you a camera. We just need you to get that data, right? You, we just need you to get that going for your patients. And so, you know, there, there, are, there are a number of different places that you might find it. Is there a really solid one? I, I can't think of any one uh, specifically, but um, there's a, those... there's... go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Sorry, sorry Harry. Uh, uh, hey, Mendy, good, good to see you. And thank you for the shout out in the chat. Um, and uh, in particular, because I know you're in Southern California, there's a uh, foundation called the UniHealth Foundation that uh, has given uh, large dollar grants to uh, Southern California clinics for projects like these. Uh, Una Health, um, and I'm happy to uh, talk to you a little bit more because I've I've talked to the folks there, um, and I I have there's a few details that I can share with you um, if you want to contact me. Great information, awesome! I'm gonna check that out too. Una Health. Um, so there are some comments, you know, which I know is just kind of a. Uh, a familiar topic when we have this conversation of um, looking for proof that this is acceptable um, and looking for more current guidance in the recent in 2022-ish that says this is allowed. Um, and I know um, based on talking to you guys and what you've shared that we're all looking for that, uh, some, some real clear definition that says yay or nay. Um, again, I just want to offer that we do have our billing guide and CTRC is here to help um, connect and provide those more specific nitty gritty um, payment and detailing information or connect you with someone um, who can provide those answers. But uh, this is a common <laughs> um, conversation topic with uh, finding out those flexibilities. Um, and just a, a lovely shout out uh, for Mendy that uh, Mark is super helpful at answering these questions and providing a great customer service. So um, just another plug to reach out to Mark um, for more information. Alrighty, do we have any other questions? I'll give it just one more minute. Um, if I can, uh, I saw it in the chat. Um, Mendy had mentioned that he they were thinking of looking into providing ret retinal on site and having their optometrist read it, which is uh, uh, which is certainly uh, putting optometrists into primary care health care sites has really increased over over time because there there's a great value add. Uh, we and we work with clinics that have an optometrist on site, and in addition, we have a camera operating that the um, medical assistance used to to capture because a lot of these clinics actually can't keep up with the diabetic patients with one one or even sometimes two optometrists in multiple sites, and so it's a really good adjunct uh, to to have. We've had clinics that have uh, discontinued services with us because they were having an optometrist come on board, and then half a year later they. Uh, they reach back out to us to kind of set, set up um, a retinal teleretinal program as well. And so the optometrist uh, has access to, to the patients and IPACs as well. And that that's a clinical value to the, to the eye care provider there. And, and it, it actually does speak to the power of telehealth and the ability to triage because those patients that we actually identify as being normal, they don't necessarily need to go see that optometrist at that FQHC every single year. What we do doesn't replace an eye exam. It only, it only qualifies for the diabetic retinal exam. 
So completely replacing eye exams with this modality isn't going to happen, nor should it, but it does allow us to be able to identify who needs help. That person can even be triaged into the optometry clinic at the FQHC to, you know, to, to validate our findings and to, and to properly uh, um, time any kind of referral that needs to happen into specialty care. And they're also boots on the ground in the sense that we're remote, but, but their local resources, they're going to know much better what they can do and what they can manage to help the patients get to the right place in, in a timely fashion. So, um, so it is something to consider that even if you do have optometry services at your clinic, that it is, uh, it, it is a good way to really help cover all of your diabetic patients because otherwise your optometrist will just be screaming, screening diabetics all day long and won't be able to provide other eye care services to the rest of your patient population. Great point. Follow up to that. Can primary care providers be trained to read these screenings or do uh, you feel an optomo optometrist um, is better suited for reading diabetic retina? Well, so yeah, we, we have had clinics that have had primary care providers, actually not just primary care providers. Also, I think we had an in, a couple of internists and maybe even endocrinologists. Certainly, they, the, the, the doctors can learn how to do this for sure. Generally, with, with what we do with IPAX is, is that there's, uh, there's a quality control um, element to it. So we just make sure that we have what we call overreads of a certain percentage of the, the, the primary, if it's a PCP, mm -hmm. um, looking at a certain percentage of the ones that they do for just to make sure that, you know, that quality is there. And just, you know, so it doesn't necessarily have to be an optometrist. Again, some there is, I, again, I think there's, there's a lot of value for other eye conditions that maybe the primary care doc um, isn't so, isn't as familiar with, but specifically just for the di diabetic retinopathy screening, absolutely. We've had primary care physicians and other specialists that have decided they want to go through the training to learn how to identify the lesions and do the readings themselves. Great. And we'll do one last question. Do patients have to be dilated? That is a great question. I don't know. I can't believe it. we never addressed it, but maybe we didn't. Um, it, it, generally, no. Um, there are always going to be patients that uh, won't be successful unless you dilate them. And there will even be a subset of patients that even when you dilate them, <laughs> the, the, the pictures aren't successful. Um, but uh, probably, you know, with a, with a competent um, uh, user in terms of operator of whatever diabetic retinal camera that you're using, um, usually about 90% of patients can be successfully imaged without dilation. Uh, we recommend that there's, there's the option of dilation if absolutely necessary, and we have protocols and safe ways of doing that. Um, but most of the most of the imaging that we deal with out there is what we call non midriatic. It does not require the dil dilation. Well, that's great. Awesome. Well, thank you guys uh, both so much for sharing all of this information. Um, it's very helpful. Um, I'm glad to see so many questions and participation uh, throughout this session. Um, one more plug to say that Harry and Mark will be available in about 20 minutes uh, for some peer chat time. So if you want to have a deep conversation with them and really get into even more nitty gritty about this, um, now's your chance to pester them. So please sign up for a peer chat and drop in in their room to continue the conversation. Uh, we also have a few other peer hosts um, available to chat in with and um, connect with. Um, so please join us. If you are not going to join us for the peer chats today, then uh, thank you so much for attending day one of the telehealth summit. And we look forward to another day full of telehealth learning and networking tomorrow. So we hope you join us for day two. Um, and thank you to our attendees and our speakers. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks Thank again you. to the CRTRC and Ochin and all sponsors. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. <Aaron. laughs>